Good evening. My name is Berkowitz, and I'm a member of the board of directors of Voices of Hope. And I want to welcome you to the first program in Voices of Hope's virtual summer series. Voices of Hope is an organization founded by descendants of Holocaust survivors with the mission of promoting a culture of courage to stand up against hatred through Holocaust and genocide education and remembrance. We are pleased and honored to welcome Helen Epstein to open our summer series. Helen Epstein has published 10 books of literary nonfiction, including the trilogy Children of the Holocaust in 1979, one of the first books to examine the intergenerational transmission of trauma. Where She Came From, A Daughter's Search for Her Mother's History, and The Long Half-Lives of Love and Trauma. Her mother, Francie Rabinick Epstein's memoir, Francie's War, with an afterword by Helen, was published in 2020 by Penguin US and UK and in the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Born in Prague in 1947, Helen grew up in New York City and became a journalist while a college student caught in the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. She freelanced for the Sunday New York Times and other publications while teaching journalism at New York University. She specialized in profiling cultural figures such as art historian Meyer Shapiro, theater producer Joseph Papp, and musicians Vladimir Horowitz and Leonard Bernstein. Her books have been translated into Czech, Hungarian, French, Italian, Swedish, Dutch, German, Japanese, and Chinese. She lives in Massachusetts. Tonight's moderator is Kimberly Bolero. Kimberly serves as director of the Holocaust Education Research and Outreach Center, or the HERO Center, a joint initiative between the Maurice Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies and Voices of Hope. So let's give a warm welcome to Kimberly Bolero and Helen Epstein. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Lois, and welcome to everyone to our conversation this evening. Um, uh, we are so pleased to have Helen Epstein here with us tonight to learn more about her experience uh, with publishing her mother's memoir, Francie's War. Uh, through the presentation and conversation, um, we will keep the audience muted. You will remain muted to reduce background noise during the program. If you have a comment or a question, uh, for Helen, please submit it through the chat box and we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Um, we also thank you in advance for any, uh, for any technical issues um, throughout the program. We would really appreciate your patience with that. Um, and so I will turn it over to Helen. Thank you all again for joining us tonight um, and uh, take it away, Helen. Thank you all of you for inviting me and welcome everybody. I'm going to um, start with an excerpt from a book I wrote, The Long Half Lives of Love and Trauma, and that'll be followed by one from my mother's um, new memoir. So, when I was growing up, I came home from school to women being fitted for clothes by my mother. Francie, a dressmaker from Prague, worked with a cigarette dangling from her lips and a tape measure around her neck. She had great savoir-faire and spoke with a continental accent that persuaded clients to overlook the fact that her salon was inside our apartment. What should have been the master bedroom was my mother's workroom with its sewing machines, headless mannequins, and cutting table. What should have been our living room was what my mother called the salon. There, customers stood on a lazy Susan while my mother pinned their hems and seams. I was both fascinated by and jealous of the attention her clients got from my mother. She had her favorites like Vivian Vance from the I Love Lucy show, who was famous but never difficult. I knew I had to disappear when a Mrs. Sinatra or the first Mrs. Trump was having a fitting. Women attached to famous men, my mother said, could cause trouble. One of them had absconded to the Yucatan with her dresses, bills unpaid. I wouldn't want to share a prison cell with any of these dames, Francie said. Prison was one of her usual frames of reference. My mother enjoyed dressing beautiful women, and Mrs. Lewis was one. Mrs. Lewis was a former Hollywood starlet who married a man whose company made most of the spark plugs in American cars. 
You can marry more money in five minutes than you can make in 50 years, she said. And my mother did not contradict her. In the camps, she said, beautiful women had leveraged their looks for food. On the other hand, some had wound up murdered or raped. You needed brains too. I hated it when my mother casually dropped the word camps into conversation, like ash from her cigarettes. Her Auschwitz tattoo was enough of a reminder that the elegant dressmaker was also a Holocaust survivor. During a selection in Auschwitz by Dr. Mengele, she had claimed to be an electrician and lying had saved her life. Falsifying was part of her business. She padded breasts, shoulders, and derrieres. She was a repository of client secrets, marriage problems, and love affairs. My mother brought little sentiment to her work. Mrs. Lewis had done well to marry rich. Romance was for Hollywood. Being poor was hard. My father, an Olympic athlete who spoke beautiful Czech but no English, was unemployed for nearly 10 years after arriving in New York. Francie was the family breadwinner and manager. When I was seven, she added a psychoanalyst to her list of doctors. Francie nursed a kind of contempt for the teenager she had been before the war and her, for her customers who believed the version of love they saw in the movies. She had married at 20 and her first husband had been more of a playmate than a partner. She never talked about their first touch, their first dance or their first kiss, those significant moments that I read about in girls' literature. She didn't talk about that in regard to my father either. They met on the street, there was no courtship, there was a housing shortage. One date at the swim club and 24 hours later, they were living together. Many anomalous unions then were called lager marriages because they were transacted in camps soon after the war and between survivors far less compatible than my parents. No matter how unlikely the partners, divorce was rare. The war served as marital glue and it was permanent. No refugee could afford divorce, my mother sometimes said. None viewed infidelity as reasonable cause. That was the kind of nonsense her, her customers believed. In February of 1948, three years after the war ended, there was a communist coup in Czechoslovakia. Kurt saw the, my father saw the communists as Nazis in a different color uniform and was determined to get out. He applied for an American visa and with an affidavit from relatives, we flew out of Prague and joined the refugee community in New York City. Hold on a second. I am having, I am having some uh, problems here. Uh, here we go. My mother cooked, worked, and ran the household, eventually having three children. Work structured her days, subsumed her disappointments and unhappiness, and provided a creative outlet. Her customers were difficult. Many of them could not make up their minds what they wanted. Some expected my mother to solve their romantic problems with a blouse. Others were ill. They needed a therapist, not a dressmaker. They made her even more contemptuous than she already was of women. On the rare occasions when my mother read me fairy tales, she would snap the book shut as though to say that I could not count on being awakened by a kiss or rescued. A girl had to be woke, not asleep, self-reliant, not dependent, and not expect anyone to save her, let alone a prince. When American mothers gave their daughters elaborate Sweet Sixteen parties, mine sent me off alone to travel abroad. Before I left, she handed me a prescription for birth control pills, quote, in case. She didn't explain what that meant. She didn't discuss sexual feeling, but took me to see the Italian film Two Women, in which a mother and daughter are raped by marauding soldiers during the Second World War. Being female meant being vulnerable. Matters of life or death could be determined in a split second. They had been. 
So that's an extract from a book that I wrote last year called The Long Half-Lives of Love and Trauma. And now I'm going to read you an extract from my mother's memoir, which was just published, which I think will shed some light on what you just heard. So in um, June of 1939, that is to say before the Second World War originally, it officially began, um, my mother and her parents were arrested by the Gestapo because, as you probably know, the German army invaded Czechoslovakia in March of 1939, half a year before the war started. So here's from my mother's book, From Francie's War. In June of 1939, my, mother, my parents and I were arrested by the Gestapo because of my boyfriend's mother's jewelry. This was my first contact with the Gestapo. They arrested my parents first without telling them the charges and me a few hours later when I returned home from an errand. I was not mistreated during those long hours. I was even offered chocolate and cigarettes, alternating with threats of shooting me if I didn't talk. That night, I was put in a car with my parents and two Gestapo men. By midnight, we were all led off to different cells. I was put in with two middle-aged ladies to whom I announced that this was all some terrible mistake and that clearly I would be going home in the morning. One of them seemed to find my announcement very amusing, while the other just waved her hand, too depressed to argue with me. The first woman was named Marianne Goltz. She was very attractive, with flaming red hair and the self-assurance of an actress, which it turned out she had been. The second was Ludmilla, the wife of a high officer in the Czechoslovak army, whose husband had fled the country to join the free Czech soldiers abroad. My two cellmates could not have been more different from each other. Where one was flamboyant and witty, the other was dignified and quiet. Where one's moral attitude seemed questionable, the other had been married for 25 years to the same husband. These involuntary roommates had more in common than I understood. They both were protected of, of me and took it upon themselves to give me an elementary education in the ground rules of German detention. The first rule was not to let your interrogators know anything they did not already know. Never admit anything they told me, especially not the truth. Never volunteer information, no matter what the promise of reward. To my 19-year-old eyes, Marianne seemed like an adventuress and demi-mondaine with great compassion for others, an enormously courageous daredevil. Ludmilla's courage manifested itself more in quiet resistance to her captors. I believe that neither of them ever implicated another person during the entire time they were detained. I learned that Marianne was an early anti-Nazi, a Christian, who had been married to a Jewish journalist in Vienna. He had fled in March of 1938. Mariana had stayed behind in Vienna, obtained a quick divorce on racial grounds, and went to work to help her friends. She smuggled their money and jewelry into Switzerland while carrying on an affair with an SS officer in Vienna. This affair allowed her to make a fair number of useful connections in the high echelons of the SS. It had all worked beautifully until the day when the gentleman was transferred to more important duties. At that point, Mariana decided to move her activities to Prague. Here she became involved with the Czech resistance. Unfortunately, someone talked too much and Mariana wound up in jail as Ludmilla's cellmate. Despite all her connections to the SS, she was unable to get word out that she was being held in Pankrat's prison. Fascinated by Mariana's story, I listened closely to what she reported about the experience of the Jews in Austria and the methods used by the Nazis. We had plenty of time and nothing else to do since day after day went by without any of us being called in for questioning. Mariana explained to me the mechanics of the system of confiscation, humiliation, and finally deportations, which had already started in Vienna. Mariana did not know where these people were being taken, but she did know that the weight of their luggage was limited to 50 kilos and that everything else one owned had to stay behind. She tried to convince me to try to escape if and when I got out of prison, 
She did convince me that it was foolish for my family to remain in a centrally located apartment adjoining the business where I was employed, not only because of the risk to my employees, but because of our apartment was large and modern and would be confiscated sooner or later. We would then be forced into one room in another Jewish apartment. Two weeks later, I was called for interrogation and released half an hour later. Much later, I would learn that Mariana was released a few weeks after me when one of her SS friends returned from a trip and did not find her home. But she was rearrested in 1943 when her luck ran out. She was beheaded in Pankratz prison that year. So that's an excerpt from my mother's book. And now I'm going to tell you how that had to do with my publishing my mother's manuscript. In the 1990s, after my mother died of a brain aneurysm, I wrote about this Pankrat cell incident in my book about three generations of women, where she came from. And when I was done, I put my mother's manuscript away. 20 years later, I received an unexpected email from a man in Berlin named Ronnie Goltz. Ronnie Goltz wrote that he had read about Francie's prison cell conversation with a cellmate in Prague in my book, Where She Came From, and that Marianne Goltz had been his father's first wife. Ronnie was my age, second generation, and wanted to know more. So I dug into my files, found my mother's manuscript, and emailed him the rel relevant pages. Then I myself reread the whole thing. My mother had typed it in English on onion skin paper. It began and ended in Prague and covered the years 1939 to 1948. During that time, she was moved from the center of Prague to the suburbs. Then she was deported to Terezin. From there, she was deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau, then to work camps in Hamburg, and finally to Bergen-Belsen. She was liberated by the British Army and returned to Prague in the fall of 1945. Francie's War, as you can gather both from um, the selection I read to you and the selection I read from my own book, was very involved with women and the relationships between women. And I think her memoir is most valuable because it looks at the German occupation from the point of view of a well-educated young woman who had been running a business when Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia. She was also an avid reader who read in four languages, and her memoir is well written and filled with specific details that are of historical and literary value. For example, she describes the weather on the day the German mar army marched into Prague. She describes the Nazi who, aria who arianized her salon and how he sized up his prospects. She tells us why she decided to have a nose job and an abortion during the Nazi occupation, how she became addicted to cigarettes after she was separated from her parents in Terezin, how she decided to lie to Dr. Mengele during the selection at Auschwitz, how she nursed her cousin Kitty's boils in Hamburg by stealing yeast cakes from a German bakery, how her sister prisoners formed alliances, fell in love, and or bartered sex for food with men and women, got pregnant, got sick, and died. Francie's war was at the very least her fourth telling of her concentration camp experience. She wrote the first one while she was a prisoner in Hamburg when she stole a notebook and kept a diary in the form of letters to her mother. After a guard discovered it, the camp commandant made her burn it page by page in his stove. In New York City in 1955, Francie retold her experiences to a psychoanalyst. In 1974, I interviewed her for the American Jewish Committee's collection of Holocaust survivor audio testimonies, which are now archived at the New York Public Library. So her narrative was by then very well thought through. Reading her text again nearly 30 years later, I hear her voice candid and contemporary. In 1975, that candor might have been the reason no publisher would publish her memoir. By 2018, the world had caught up with Francie. Television shows like Orange is the New Black lifted the curtain on women in prison. 
in academia, women scholars, Holocaust scholars, and queer historians were sifting sources for documents of women in war. The Me Too movement was providing a language for discussions of the connections between sex and power. 30 years after my mother's death, my relationship to her had also changed. I was now older than Francie was at the time she died and a grandmother. With this distance, I was able to take in what I had been able to, unable to take in as a younger woman. At first, because of its specific details about women's experience, I thought the manuscript would be a valuable resource for scholars. I asked several if they would read it and tell me if it was worth publishing. Everyone said yes, but there are so many Holocaust memoirs on the market, I didn't think it would stand a chance with a commercial publisher. And because it was so Czech, I sent it to an agent in Prague. She loved it and immediately sold it to Slovak and Czech commercial publishers. My husband, who adored my mother, then persuaded me to find an American agent. 14 publishers rejected Francie's War, but the 15th bought it. And now it is a Penguin paperback, ebook, and audiobook. During the COVID pandemic, Francie's War has turned out to be a kind of survival manual for many of its readers. I'm eager to hear what you think and to answer your questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Helen. I'm, I'm really so excited to talk about this with you. Um, and you've already touched on so many of the themes found in your mother's writing um, and its effect on her and, and your family in the years following. Um, I highly encourage the audience members to read this memoir um, and the, the thoughtful afterward, Helen, that, that you provided um, to, to bring more uh, contemporary, I guess, uh, to give more context onto how, how the story continues. I won't give too much, tell me if I'm giving too much away at any point. Um, <laughs> but I, I would highly encourage the audience to, to read this memoir for how candid it is. Um, and how exploratory it is of, of women's experiences during the Holocaust. I think it's also, um, as you said, it's very Czech. And so you can, you can tell going through it, it's, it's very specific to this geographical location. Um, so I, I think that I, that was really interesting about it. And, and really just to simply read a remarkable retelling of Francie's experiences, her strategies um, of coping, and so much more. Um, so it is time to move to some questions. So if uh, anybody in the audience does have a question, you can use, uh, you can send us some questions via the chat option. Um, you should see that at the bottom of your screen if you roll your, your arrow, uh, your pointer over it. Um, you should be able to click that and then send us some questions. Um, or if you have comments, if you've read the book, um, please, uh, you, your comments are absolutely welcome. Um, but maybe to, to get us started, Helen, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how long you think it took your mother to, to work on this manuscript and finish this manuscript. And was it something that she worked on alone? Is this something that she she spoke about with the the fellow survivors that, that she mentions in this book? Well, the answer is we don't have a clue. I have two younger brothers. Um, none of us ever saw her working on this. None of us ever remember ever hearing about this. It's possible that she talked about it with her friends. Um, as a writer myself, I'm just amazed that we never found any handwritten notes or handwritten um, drafts. She seems to have sat down at an English typewriter and written this in English. Uh, the manuscript does have annotations, but not all that many. Uh, so I'm just really um, perplexed. And of course, at the time, I was 26 years old when she wrote this, and I was involved in my own life, so I didn't really spend much time asking her what she was doing with, with her stuff, but m neither of my brothers remembers anything either. So the answer is no. We, we know nothing about how she decided to do this, how she did it, how long it took, nothing. Okay. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in. So, uh, so Judith sends uh, a question about, 
how much editing did you do? And uh, is the structure hers? Uh, hers, uh, Judith, do you mean Helen's or, or uh, Francie's? But I think, Helen, you'll know where to take this. Um, she says, it's very interesting that she takes on close third point of view the moment she enters the camp. And I think we'll, we'll cover that in a moment, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about right. the editing process. The editing process, as I said, my mother was fluent in four languages. She was an avid reader. You know, she was the kind of person who every time she read the Sunday book, the Times book review, and when she saw a book she liked, she immediately ordered it from the library. Her favorite author was Nabokov. So that gives you a sense of how literary she was. I mean, my favorite author is not Nabokov. And um, so, so there's very little wine editing to do. In terms of structural editing, I, I made one big edit. I took out her prologue because she had written it in 1974, we think, and it was really dated. She talked about East Germany and West Germany. She talked about the Vietnam War. And rather than fool around and try and edit it, I just said, okay, I'm just going to get rid of it. I'm going to start with her first chapter and I will put um, I'll take the salient points from her prologue and put them at the end. The second thing I did, which was, um, which somebody had to do, I think, was she had no chapters. It was 150 pages of straight uh, narrative, um, which is great if you're a modernist poet, but it's not so great for this. So I chopped it up into um, small chapters. So that's what I did. Structurally, I did one other thing. There was a page missing. There was page two was missing for some reason. I don't think it was a, a uh, I think somehow it must have gotten lost. And I thought that would be a good place to move up some of her uh, family history. So that is the only thing I did. Uh, in terms of, uh, you didn't ask this, but I'm telling you this anyway. As a journalist, I was intrigued about fact-checking it because um, there were just so many things that were fascinating. And there were, you remember she wrote this way before there was an internet. So since she wrote this, there's been all this documentation of some of the people she describes um, and of the camps she was in. And all of this is accessible to me and was not accessible to her. For example, you know, that Ronnie Goltz, the son of the first husband of Marianne Goltz could reach me is just amazing. I mean, another thing that happened was that um, my mother and her first husband adopted an orphan girl in Terezin when they were in Terezin. And um, I thought, well, um, I've got the internet. I'm going to put out a note, I'm going to put out an alert on Jewish genealogy Facebook page and um, see if I can find this woman, this, this girl, you know, I, I know that she was in Terezin with her older brother and she was an orphan. And of course, the wonderful people on Jewish genealogy portal not only contacted me, but found me a photograph of this orphan who died in Auschwitz. And um, it's in the book. Absolutely. Yes, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that. So actually, the second part of Judah's question um, is that she points out this third person uh, narrative. Um, there is a very vivid, transformative moment in the memoir for your mother while in Auschwitz. Um, it's a, it seems like a deep realization of her situation and what is happening around her. Um, so at this point, in her memoir, Francie is no longer Francie, she becomes A-4116 um, and refers to this, I'll use, you know, quote, other person um, until she is liberated. So can you tell us a little bit about this moment of, of transition for your mother? Yes, my mother had spent the first two years in the camps in Theresienstadt, which was um, a very Czech dominated society. She knew a lot of people there. She was able to work as a dressmaker there. Um, she was with her first husband there. Um, she was with two cousins there. And um, one of her cousins was an actress and would give performances. She was part of the artistic life of Terezin. So when she, when she was deported to Auschwitz, it was a terrible, terrible shock. And it was nothing like Theresienstadt. And uh, her cousin Kitty 
got there ahead of her. And when, and when my mother arrived, um, she was taken to the Czech family camp, which those of you who don't know about the Czech family camp, this is a whole other story. Within the enormous Auschwitz complex, there was a Czech family camp to which people from Terezin were sent, and that was part of the ruse to, to fool the, Red, the International Red Cross into thinking that Jews weren't being exterminated. And my mother totally bought into this. And she gets to Auschwitz and Kitty, Kitty meets her in the Czech family camp. And she basically spills the beans and says that um, Jews are being gassed to death and then cremated in Auschwitz. And my mother thinks her cousin has gone out of her mind because Kitty was two years younger and she wasn't as smart as my mother. And she just thought Kitty was nuts. And then she went outside with Kitty and smelled the flesh burning. And she went back into her bunk. And this was after she had been tattooed. And she describes sitting in a bunk, looking at her arm and looking at that too, tattoo and watching the tattoo become two tattoos, two arms, two bodies. And I think the trauma at that moment was so profound that from that time on, she thought of herself not as Francie, but as A4116. And many people have asked me, you know, do, do I think she wrote that as a literary device? And my answer is no, I don't think so. I think that was the way she experienced Auschwitz and what she, her, her memoir is very realistic and she's describing exactly how she felt. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, actually one of our committee members, uh, Sharon, she has a question about the differences in text um, in different translations. Could you speak a little bit to that about I the languages? Really, I haven't had time to read all of the translations. First of all, I don't read Slovak. Um, I haven't really had time to go through the Czech translation. It is going to be translated into French, which is kind of interesting because my mother went to French schools and she, you know, she would have been a good person to read the French translation. It's also going to be translated into Italian. Um, I'm very surprised that it has not been bought in Israel or in Germany, but um, maybe it will be still, but I can't speak to the translations. Okay, um, so we have an, another question actually um, from, from Ruth in the audience. She, she asks, was your mother alive when Children of the Holocaust was published? And if so, what was her reaction? Yes, um, my father had died uh, before Children of the Holocaust was published and before the New York Times article in 1977 that preceded the um, publication of the book. My mother was very much alive. She was very, very involved in it. She, as a New York Times reader, and particularly as a Sunday New York Times reader, she was utterly thrilled to find um, this article I had written on the cover of the New York Times magazine. And of course, being a New York City resident and a dressmaker, all of her customers read the New York Times on Sunday. In fact, two million people read the New read, used to read the New York Times on Sunday. So she was thrilled. And she basically um, agreed with everything I wrote in the book. And what's really peculiar is that she decided that she would like to do the promotion of the book with me. So the two of us went on national television together and we were interviewed on Good Morning America and um, the ABC one. I can't remember what it, or that was called Good Morning America. The other one was called what? Um, today, the Today Show. Oh, okay. And on Good Morning America, I believe it was, the two of us were interviewed by the then living psychoanalyst Bruno Bettelheim, which was an extremely bizarre experience. And I was so intimidated by him that I just didn't answer anything and let my mother talk. So my mother was very, very much a part of Children of the Holocaust. Um, not all survivors were as supportive as my mother was. I got a lot of angry letters from survivors um, saying that I was, um, I was uh, allowing Hitler to have a posthumous victory. 
And um, it was a controversial book, odd as that may seem. But um, it turns out to have helped lots of people, not only in our community, but in lots of other communities. So I have no regrets whatsoever about having written it. I do regret that I couldn't um, enlarge the book at the time for budgetary reasons. Um, I was planning to have, I was planning to have um, a chapter a piece on a gay French and a gay Belgian uh, man and woman. And unfortunately, I never got to include those because I never had the money to go to France to uh, interview them. And of course, you know, this was pre-internet, pre-everything, so. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, I have no regrets about children in the Holocaust. Very nice. So mother and daughter on the Today Show early in the morning, huh? with a psychoanalyst. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a bad joke in there somewhere, I'm sure. Right. Um, so uh, we have another question. Uh, so comment and question um, from uh, a second Ruth in the audience. Uh, My parents hid together in a Polish farmhouse for two years during World War II. They each wrote their versions of the story. I scanned the onion skin typed pages, uh, <laughs> sent it to an editor friend and self-published. Um, it has been a huge gift to my family and put this story in print about 10 years ago. Um, it has since been published in Polish, Russian and Italian through literary agents. Many people have read the book and it feels strange to me that these people feel as if they know my parents. Have you had this experience? Absolutely. Not only do people feel, you know, my parents, they feel they know me. So every time, because I wrote Children of the Holocaust, everybody knows everything or thinks, thinks they know everything about my life. And so I often have the experience, especially at bookstores, at readings where I meet somebody and I say something and they'll say, well, I know. <laughs> and um, of course, I, it, it isn't reciprocal because I don't know anything about them. So um, yes, it has happened to me. It's a great gift. I'm very pleased that you were able to have the success you had with your book. Um. Uh, we have a, we do have a, I think a number of, of uh, children of Holocaust survivors in the audience tonight. Um, uh, Adele sends us, uh, my parents were survivors as uh, almost everyone I knew growing up. My question is, what are your thoughts about what kind of people the survivors became after the war regarding anxiety, anger, uh, multitude of emotions, uh, ability to show affection, optimism? Um, do you think it was influenced more by their experience? Uh, genetics? Uh, we have a few more questions coming in, so I lost my spot for just a moment. Uh, <laughs> one second, let me scroll down again. Uh, but maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about that question of emotion and transformation and right. what is, you know, what these, where these characteristics may or may not have come from. Right. Well, I think if you read Children of the Holocaust, and it's still, it's still worth reading if you've never read it, um, even though it's 40 years old now, you'll see that there's a huge variety of experiences in survivors. There are huge class differences. There are huge religious differences. I mean, you have everybody from ultra-Orthodox Jews to Jews who were so assimilated they denied they were Jewish or who had been baptized. You have Jews on every part of the political spectrum from anti-Zionist to Zionist and everything in between. You have age differences. You have differences between rural Jews and very, very urban Jews in every country, whether you're talking about Poland, you have people who grew up in the middle of Krakow and you have people who grew up in, in, in the countryside in tiny little shuttles. Um, you have national differences. You know, you have all the Soviet Jews who um, just now are beginning to really, really talk about their experiences during the war because when they were in Soviet, um, in the Soviet Union, they kept quiet about them. Um, you have, uh, you have survivors in Israel who were really marginalized for so many years in the 50s and 60s as kind of symbols of the diaspora. So it's very hard to make any generalizations about the group as a whole. However, I will make one generalization, and that is 
that the experience of the war changed their lives. And some of them never stopped talking about it, and some of them refused to talk about it. And that holds true for the second generation as well. I am absolutely sure that every second generation person has been affected by this history, but some of them never talk about it, and some of them talk about it all the time. Some of them see it as a source of great pride. Some of them see it as a source of great shame. I personally have met many people, many children of survivors who found out that they were Jewish only after they were 25, 30, 35, 40 years old, especially in North and South America, where it was possible to emigrate, change your name, and uh, change your religious affiliation. It's interesting that you had mentioned that, and I kind of want to jump on something you, you said. Um, the, uh, in the memoir, we learn that your mother, Francie, was baptized, I believe, into the Catholic Church. Is that correct? Right. Um, and she didn't even know that she had four Jewish grandparents right. until the Nazis came to power. Correct. Um, can you speak maybe a little bit about this issue of identity and, and how, assim I guess, this word assimilated Francie and her parents were in Prague right. society, um, and maybe how this played into their experience of being persecuted as Jews? Right. Um, yeah. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of Madeleine Albright who um, emigrated to the United States with her family from Czechoslovakia in the 1930s. And she discovered that her parents, that her four grandparents were Jews. And American Jews went up in arms and said, oh, how is this possible? She's lying, blah, blah, blah. Well, it is possible because in the night, Czechoslovakia, first of all, was founded in 1918. It was a new democratic republic and it was the only democracy in Central Europe. And it was very much like, well, I, it was much better than America today because um, it had equal rights for all its minorities and for men and women. And Jews had the option of um, identifying either as Jews or as Jews by, re by religious affiliation or as Czechs or as German speaking Czech citizens. And my mother, um, what, who was raised in the center of Prague. Her mother spoke Czech, her father spoke German. She was sent to French schools. So she was extremely cosmopolitan. The reason she was baptized at birth was because my grandfather, who was very aware of being Jewish, his name was Rabinek, which means little rabbi, and he never changed his name, even though he himself got baptized. He applied to university when he was 18 years old, and he was rejected as, at his university of choice. I believe it was Heidelberg. And uh, he decided that he wasn't going to go through that again. And so he had himself baptized, applied to another school, got in, and that was it. And so when my mother was born, he had her baptized. My mother had a very, very long baptismal certificate. When she was 13 years old, she decided, and she actually went to church as a child sometimes with the maid. And um, at school, she was in a French Catholic school, so she went to confession occasionally. But when she was 13, she decided that she was not religious and she went to the Czech uh, official registry and did something that you could do in the Czech Republic, which was to declare yourself without faith. And that's what she did. But she did not grow up with Jewish holidays. She did not think of herself as Jewish. She was told that she had a Jewish nose. And so when the Nuremberg laws came into effect in Prague, she was a big moviegoer. And she was afraid that if she went to the movies, somebody would spot her as a Jew because of her nose. And that's why she had plastic surgery in 1939 after the Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia. I found that one of the most mind boggling little details in the whole book because the idea of having plastic surgery under Nazi occupation just never occurred to me. Absolutely. I, uh, reading, reading this part of the, uh, of the memoir and seeing how, um, you know, this, this way of 
being Jewish, but not really being Jewish and actually having been baptized um, and the lengths that that we read that she goes through to, you know, to assimilate <laughs> um, under under regular under these regulations is really, really, really interesting. Um, we have a question from one of our audience members, Madison. Uh, do you think men's and women's personal narratives about surviving the Holocaust are equally represented in the canon? Similarly, do you think that female survivors' stories provide insight into different aspects of the Holocaust than those of men? Yes, to both. Um, I think that uh, I don't know what the count is. I don't know how many memoirs were written by women and how many memoirs were written by men because you have to realize we're not only talking about english language memoirs there were memoirs written in every country both during the war and after the war but let's look um, some of you are familiar with the oneg shabbat shabbat project in the warsaw ghetto when you read about that project, many of the researchers were, were women, but all of the people who wrote it and all of the people who directed it were men. And the, the, there's no question that women are marginalized in that work. There was a man named Adler in Theresienstadt who even when he was in Theresienstadt gathered, um, gathered materials that he later put in this magisterial book, I think it's, I don't know, 800 pages long, documenting Terezin, the Terezin ghetto. Same thing there, women are marginalized, you just don't read about women. If you think of all of the famous memoirs by men, Primo Levi, Elie Wiesel, um, I don't know, all of them, women, let's hazard a guess, what percentage of the text do you think is taken up by women? I can't remember offhand Elie Wiesel writing about any women, even though I know he had a sister and certainly he had a mother. Uh, I don't remember Primo Levi writing about any women in um, survival in Auschwitz. However, the women's memoirs all mention men, okay, one way or the other, as brothers, as husbands, as sons, as whatever. So that's the answer to the first part of the question. Second part of the question, what was the second part of the question again? <laughs> let, let me go right back up to it. I um, kind of remember it. Do you think the female survivor stories provide insight into different aspects of the Holocaust? Totally, totally. Because um, women write about relationships. And a lot of my mother's memoir is about the relationships, not only that she had with other women, with her cousins, with friends, with enemies, uh, with guards, uh, and her relationships with men, with fellow prisoners, with her boss when she was working as an electrician, um, with guards. So they talk about relationships. Then of course, they talk about life events that happened to women. Women menstruate. That became an issue whether or not they menstruated, when they stopped menstruating. Did they get pregnant despite having lost their menstruation? What happened when they got pregnant? Did they have the baby? What did they do with the baby? Who did they sleep with? Who did they talk to? All of that stuff is in my mother's memoir. There are a few women's memoirs that talk about this stuff. There was one really early one by a, um, I think she was a Romanian gynecologist, either Romanian or Hungarian gynecologist. I believe it was published in French in 1946. She was a gynecologist and she performed um, births and abortions in Auschwitz. But apart from her and apart from a, um, a late memoirist named Fania Heller, who was hidden um, in, a, in, 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 in a loft in a farmhouse and then later in a hole um, by a uh, Ukrainian policeman who, and she, like my mother, Fania, like my mother, later did a lot of psychoanalysis. So she really worked through her narrative. She describes uh, hiding from a young girl's point of view. She was a teenager when she was hidden. So 
I left out one thing when we were talking about the variety of survivors. We didn't talk about the variable of how they survived. So you have survivors who were partisans, you have survivors who were hidden but walking around on false papers in, in the cities. Then you have people who were hidden in the countryside. Then you have people who were in work camps. And then you have people who were in concentration camps. So hugely different experiences during the war. And it's funny just reading that question myself, I was kind of reflecting on the, the memoirs that I picked up from middle school and high school just because I, I was drawn to them and they were all written by young women. Um, I think I picked up one on my own that was written by a man and um, he, he was not very well known. I could never pronounce his name, unfortunately. Um, but the memoirs, the Holocaust memoirs I picked up were uh, Gerda Weissman Klein and mm -hmm. uh, I Have Lived a Thousand Years. Kind of some of the, the more, I suppose, young adult memoirs for mm -hmm. middle school mm -hmm. age, but those, those were the, the memoirs that I had been drawn to myself. Um, right maybe not knowing that I was looking for that reflection of, of, of gender for, uh, in, in reading something. Um, so we do have a question um, about, uh, did your parents raise you with Jewish traditions and practice? Yes, they did. I think um, my mother would say that uh, the concentration camps gave her her Jewish education. That's my mother. My father, on the other hand, was a very, very typical Czech Jewish country Jew. My grandfather Epstein was president of his synagogue and he was also the director of the choir, which gives you a sense of what kind of Jews they were. They were definitely um, reform or reform slash conservative Jews. Um, my father had had a bar mitzvah. My father still had his talis. He brought his talis to America from his bar mitzvah. He, um, they were small town Jews. And so he expected to have Jewish children. And my mother, after the war, decided she was going to have Jewish children since, you know, that she had not had this. But um, we had to explain to her how to do the holidays. And she knew no Hebrew. She, her idea of Seder was to put a tablecloth on the table with some candles and Barton's Haggadot. Barton's, or Bar Barton's was a candy store back then. And um, so I, I, I really learned about Jewish tradition and the Jewish calendar when I was a student in Israel. I, I'm a graduate of the Hebrew University. Um, so we do have another, we have another question um, uh, from, I think it's for, uh, oh, from, from Deborah. Um, she said that she finds that she's also a child of survivors. She finds that as she gets older, she feels more and more sensitive to and troubled by, uh, by her family's devastation as a result of their experiences in the Holocaust. Um, have you found this, this feeling to be a common one among children of, of survivors that uh, the feeling becomes more overwhelming? Again, I really wouldn't generalize about anything. I mean, everybody in the second generation comes to this on their own timetable. In my own family, I have two younger brothers. And uh, for many years, I was the only one who was interested in Czech culture. Uh, I was the only one who was real. I was the only one who went to Israel. Um, I was the only one who got a Jewish education took it seriously. But then both of my brothers came to uh, Jewishness in their own ways. And um, I know that, that uh, I'll tell a story that I won't say which of my brothers this was, but um, my brother, one of my brothers went to Prague for the first time uh, about, I guess it was about 10 years ago. And uh, I got a phone call from him, a cell phone call from him from, from after he had spent the day in, in Terezin, which is of course one of the big tourist attractions in the Czech Republic. And I remember he said, we just got back from Terezin and I saw this map. Did you realize there were so many concentration camps in Europe? And I kind of said, yeah, I did. But um, you know, everybody comes to this when they come to it and some people avoid it for their whole lives. 
And you just, you know, some people go to therapy for it when they're 20. Some people wind up going to therapy for it or go to a group for it for the first time when, when um, they're 65. It's really hard to generalize. So, um, you know, everybody comes to it when they come to it. And there's no judgment about how or why or when. You know, people grow up in very, very different communities. I mean, if you grow up in an ultra-Orthodox community, you're taught in some communities, like the sophomore community, that the Holocaust was punishment for people like my mother's family. You know, my mother's family went off and got baptized. Of course they should have been killed, right? So you have that kind of um, education as a child, or you have an education um, where you can be a child of Warsaw Ghetto survivors, and all you learn about is the heroism of Jews who um, defended the Warsaw Ghetto to their deaths. And then you, I, I, I've heard all these people, so the other kind of Jew that, that, that I would point out is, you know, people who, who, who's, who, survivors who spent the war in hiding are not gonna be outspoken about the Holocaust and their kids usually are not outspoken about the Holocaust. Their kids usually keep quiet about the Holocaust. So it's an incredibly fascinating but complicated bunch of issues. Thank you. And we have a lot of people writing thank you to you um, in different ways. Rhonda, Amy, uh, Gail, they're, they're here just to say thank you for um, for the books that you have written, that they're looking forward to the next ones, um, that your, uh, your expression as a child of survivors, you know, helps, uh, helps justify and validate their, their own feelings about it. So thank you to everyone who is, who is sending those in. That's, that's You're really welcome. lovely. Um, so we have, we have just a few minutes left. And so maybe my, my final question to kind of, um, bring this kind of full circle. I believe it's in the afterword and uh, which you had provided for, uh, after, for this memoir, where your, uh, your mother is talking about a trip to Colorado, where she finds herself surrounded by young people. Um, this is, of course, this is years after the war. She finds herself surrounded by young people who are talking about the politics of the time. They are they are ready to be activists. They are outspoken about, um, you know, social justice and and uh, human rights, and uh, they're ready to go to the government to to fix the problems of the time. Um, I'm not sure what what time Vietnam, that was. Vietnam. Well, it was it was Vietnam, and she she notes that if people were as vocal in the 1930s about what was happening to the Jews. As, as these young people are today, maybe, you know, maybe we would have had more help um, mm -hmm. uh, when the Nazis came to power. And I, and I really thought that was so, that was so moving that, that she really had put that in such, such eloquent words that I, uh, that I couldn't really repeat well enough. But um, I was wondering maybe if you could maybe talk to this point of um, what, what that, means for today of, of being outspoken and being able to stand up for for targeted people because this really is the the mission of voices of hope and so i wonder if you could maybe speak to to that point sure my mother would have been a hundred this year she would have been a hundred on in february and i thought of her when i saw a picture of dr ruth westheimer the sex doctor who was out protesting she's 95 and she was protesting um, on behalf of Black Lives Matter, and she was pr protesting on behalf of action against anti-Semitism as well as racism of all kinds. And I'm pretty sure that if my mother could have gone out onto the streets, she would have gone out onto the streets. I did. I went, I went and I took a knee here in uh, Lexington, Massachusetts with my husband and with many of my neighbors. And I know that many of my friends are doing that too. Um, the other thing that, you know, she, she had a, a very close view of Mr. Trump because Ivana was her customer a long time ago, when she was still Mrs. Trump. 
And my guess is that she would be working as hard as I am to try and register voters, to send postcards to voters all across the country, and to give as much money as she could to progressive causes and um, to try and flip the Congress. Well, thank you. Thank you for speaking to that point. I really thought it was, it, uh, it, it hit me uh, reading it, finishing the afterward last week, thinking it, it was so appropriate for, um, you know, it, the, the last number of years and, and just in general to, to be able to find that courage to, to stand up for, for people who, who feel, um, or who are being persecuted. So, um, so thank you so much, Helen. It has been such a pleasure to speak with you. Um, there are still comments coming in saying thank you for being here, and uh, the, the audience seems very excited about this memoir and to reread uh, books that you've published in the past. Uh, so thank you again so much for your time. It's been really wonderful to speak with you tonight. Thanks, all of you, and <laughs> stay safe. <laughs> Well, I just want to close by uh, thanking you, Helen, from one child of survivors to another for taking the time to provide a great beginning to our summer series. And Kim, thank you so much for the moderating. It was a, You did a fabulous job. And if you haven't read Francie's War or any of Helen's books, uh, I did check. They are available on Amazon. Um, and so we look for, and so we'll hopefully you can catch it there. The other thing is if there's questions that you weren't able to get answered today, um, Helen's website is helenepstein.com, I believe, yes. And there is a contact link so that, that you can click on if you have questions for her that you, you, you feel you'd like to address after having uh, listened to this really great discussion. Uh, so we look forward to our next program, which is going to be a week from today, Tuesday, June 23rd at 7 p.m. We're going to have an author, A.J. Sidransky, talk about his book, The Interpreter, uh, the story of a Jewish-American GI who escaped the Nazis and how he must return to Europe to aid in the interrogation of captured Nazis. He then must deal with the connection that one Nazi has to his and his family's suffering. It's a novel. We hope you'll join us then. And when you have a moment, I really encourage you to check out Voices of Hope's website, our Facebook page, to see all of our organization has to offer. In addition to programs such as these that we provide to the community, we work every day on our primary mission, which is to support education about the Holocaust and genocide. And if you like today's program, donations can be made on the Voices of Hope website, which is www ctvoicesofhope.org. Your support is greatly appreciated. And I want to thank everybody again for joining us. And Helen, thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night.